Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Gutsy Learning Series webinar. Before we begin the session, some reminders. If you experience any technical problems during the webinar, try refreshing the page or browser. If this isn't helping, you should have received via email a troubleshooting tips handout. You can also comment in the chat box. Please note that this webinar is recorded. A link to the video will be sent to you via email and posted to our website 24 hours after the webinar. French subtitles will be available the following week. You can access all our GL GLS videos at crohnsandcolitis.ca slash GLS. Please note that our Q&A period will be based on questions asked ahead of time during registration and the live broadcast. We cannot answer questions about specific medical situation. Also, beginning with this webinar, Crohn's and Colitis Canada will be offering our national education webinars in both English and French whenever possible. So for the folks who are joining us today who prefer to listen in French, you should see an option on your menu bar that looks like a globe with the word um, interpretation underneath. If you press that icon, you should be able to select French to hear the presentation in French. For those who are joining us via mobile, you may not see that glo uh, globe icon, but you should be able to see a more option or three dots. If you click on either more or the three dots, you should be able to see um, an option for you to click on to listen to uh, the presentation in French. So our next COVID-19 web and IBD webinar led by our superheroes, Dr. Gil Kaplan and Eric Benchimal will also have live translation. The topic is hitting the COVID-19 wall. And if you haven't registered already, you can do so by scanning the QR code on this slide or going to crohnsandcolitis.ca slash COVID-19 webinars. Tonight's webinar is on biologics and biosimilars. Although we have materials on our website and have hosted webinars in the past about biologics and biosimilars, we wanted to offer you this opportunity to learn from two of Canada's foremost IBD and systematic review experts on these two therapeutic products and any updates on scientific evidence on their interchangeability. Systematic review, for those of you who don't understand this term, is a process whereby all research studies published to date on a specific subject are collated and evaluated to determine as a whole the quality of evidence for the specific subject. The Cochrane Group was started in 1993 with a mandate to conduct such systematic reviews. We also felt it timely to present again since provincial governments led by British Columbia and Alberta have been working towards implementing switch policies from biologics to biosimilars. Our promise is to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and improve the lives of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. One way we meet this promise is by offering education activities to help inform you on the latest evidence and information on IBD. So we hope you find tonight's webinar on biologics and biosimilars educational and helpful. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers tonight. Dr. Remo Panaccioni is a professor of medicine and the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Unit, Unit at the University of Calgary. He is the 2020 Crohn's and Colitis Canada Outstanding Physician of the Year and has been recently recognized as a 2020 Clarivate Research Scholar for being cited in the top 1% of researchers cited in the world. He's the author of over 300 peer reviewed journal articles including publications in journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Nature, and Annals of Internal Medicine. His special interests include advanced therapies, biological therapy, and delivery of care. He is a recognized authority on IBD therapeutics and has co-authored numerous guidelines for the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. He actively participates in clinical trials on new therapeutic agents in Crohn's disease and UC. Dr. Paul Moyetti is a professor of medicine and past director of the Division of Gastroenterology at McMaster University. He holds the Audrey Campbell Chair of UC Research 
and is currently the Assistant Dean of Research at McMaster University. He has published over 425 peer-reviewed articles that have been cited over 56,000 times. He was co-editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Gastroenterology from 2010 to 2015. He is currently the joint coordinating editor of the Gut Cochrane Review Group and was co-author of the Joint Canadian Asso Association of Gastroenterology and Crohn's and Colitis Canada's position statement on biosimilars. He is a principal investigator of the Imagine Network study supported by us, Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Welcome Drs. Panaccioni and Moyetti. Dr. Panaccioni. So welcome everyone. Um, and thanks for the kind introduction, Kate. I hope we have an interesting and sort of interactive evening tonight. Uh, as Kate has, su has suggested, uh, we've talked about uh, biologics and biosimilar medications in the past. And this is really sort of, we're at a crossroads within Canada as many provincial payers and stakeholders are looking at biosimilar switch policies. So I think one of the things that we'll be doing tonight is really looking at that crossroads between Bio, the biologic era, the new biologic era, and what I'm going to call the biosimilar era. This is not going to be an in-depth overview of, uh, of sort of each one of the biologics that we have. So just trying to get control here. Okay. So we have a, a few polling questions before we start, get, start into the presentation. So the first uh, polling question is, how would you rate your current understanding of biologic medications? So none, a little, somewhat good or very good. Let's see the results. I think we're glitching. Sarah, do you have control of the polls? Uh, there we go. Okay. So we have probably sort of a split between people who have a little, a little bit of uh, sort of knowledge versus uh, sort of more knowledge. And I, I bet you that it, that's going to sort of segregate in into uh, the different um, uh, proportion of patients that are on biologics. Um, so biosimilars are somewhat different. So uh, how would you rate your current understanding of a biosimilar medication? Okay, so, uh, you know, the majority of the audience has, you know, none or, or little. So there's going to be a lot to learn uh, with respect to that. I'll control the polling from now. Um, the next question is, have you been switched from, or sorry, we're going to go back to this other question. Uh, are you currently taking a biologic medication? And the biologics that we're talking about are either a drug called Humira, Remicade, Intivio, or Stellara. So about half of you are. Looks like some of the polls are coming up already. Um, if you've used biologic medication, have you switched to a biosimilar? Uh, very small proportion here looks like they've switched to a biosimilar the understanding seems to be low. Okay. So 
getting a little glitchy on the uh, on the polling. So I'll, I'm just going to move ahead and start with the presentation here. So um, so these are just my disclaimers. Uh, I think the most important thing to recognize here is uh, what I do for sort of in my academic life is I'm a clinical trials researcher. So many of the drugs that we're going to talk about uh, tonight, um, I've been involved either in their development and or sort of how to use them better in clinical trials. So um, I, I do have a conflict of interest when it comes to some of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but hopefully it, uh, we're not going to get into specifics here. So I think one of the best places to start when we talk about biologics and biosimilars is to just review the treatment and tr overview of treatment and treatment goals in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, one of the key things that comes up when we speak to patients is what they want to know is where do we position these medications and and so it's important to have that understanding. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of editorialization and talk about biologic therapies as a group and how they've revolutionized the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, for those of you in the audience who um, have suffered from the from either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease before uh, 1998, you probably sort of have bridged what we call the pre-biologic and the biologic error. And then I'm going to give you a primer on biosimilars, and then uh, Dr. Moyetti will take it from there and sort of talk about the evidence related to all of them. So I think it's, it's very, very important, not only for patients, but for physicians to recognize uh, the overall management of IBD as a chronic uh, disease. So if we really wanted to be in the perfect world that we could take care of our patients and we can perform at our best as physicians, these are the things that we would want to do. We'd want to make the diagnosis quickly uh, and accurately. We'd want to be able to assess the disease severity at the time that you're diagnosed and determine your prognosis. We know that all of, uh, all of the uh, patients out there don't have a poor prognosis. So there's this large spectrum of uh, whether or not you have sort of a mild course with your inflammatory bowel disease and those unfortunately who may have a more difficult course. Um, so Sarah, I think that you're on timing here. So that's what's happening here. The, the, the slides are self-advancing. Um, we wanna select the appropriate therapy for the appropriate patient uh, to, to induce in what we call maintain remission. And the latter part is probably the most important is to have a drug that you can stay on long-term that's effective and safe. And we wanna be able to have a discussion with our patients regarding um, what the target is that we're trying to treat. In, in your day-to-day -day life, the most important thing is how you feel, your symptoms and how they affect your quality of life. Um, unfortunately, we know that there's this disconnect between those symptoms and whether or not your disease is active. And many of you may have had this discussion with your gastroenterologist where they're saying, well, maybe we should change medication because you still have some inflammation. That's a very, very important educational uh, sort of uh, component of what we do and make sure that patients understand that disconnect between feeling well and controlling the disease. Ultimately, because we know that these diseases are associated uh, with hospitalization and surgeries, we would like to modify the long-term outcomes of the disease. We'd like to reduce your hospitalization, reduce disability, and reduce the proportion of patients who go, uh, who go to surgery. We wanna make sure that we have the ability to monitor for relapse. And in 2021, that uh, means trying to uh, employ uh, techniques uh, and strategies where we can tell whether or not you are going to have a flare of your disease before you actually have what we call a symptomatic flare. And obviously during this uh, time period, we wanna be able to monitor for drug and drug related uh, complications. Unfortunately, due to systemic reasons, um, access and some, access not only to providers, but to medications, and we'll get into this, uh, we don't achieve all of the, the outcomes that we want. And the reasons are 
we're too late in our diagnosis or treatment initiation. And this is where the role of Crohn's Colitis Canada as an advocacy group, advocacy group comes up and you as individual patients to ensure that you know, the general public understand what these diseases are so that they seek medical attention sooner rather than later. Um, we also employ therapies that don't work. There are historical therapies like mesalamine or 5-ASAs, steroids or azathioprine, and in particular uh, steroids where patients are exposed repeatedly to steroids so there's no long-term plan. And as I said before, the most important thing is probably to uh, have uh, drugs that work long term. Therapies are not always optimized, uh, and we know that for individual patients, individual patients may need different doses of drugs or different timing of drugs to make sure that they have an optimal response. And this really speaks to the difference between perhaps what Dr. Moyetti is going to show you within what we call the clinical trials, where we assess efficacy of drugs and the effectiveness of these drugs in real world practice, because we can play around with the drugs in a way that we can't in uh, the clinical trials to increase the benefit that they may have for, uh, for the individual patient. And again, we talked about this disconnect between the way a patient feels and uh, the way uh, and whether there's active inflammation. Much of this, as you can tell, has to do with education. I think that we need and we need to do a better job in educating our patients on what the standards are and the goals of care are in 2021. And I do believe that CCC has done an excellent job in moving this. But tonight we're going to talk more about therapies and, and optimizing therapies. We have the benefit at the University of Calgary of training uh, gastroenterologists from all over the world who, who really want to specialize in the care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And, you know, if you take a 30,000 foot view of how to care for somebody with IBD, it really boils down to these four pillars. And these are important to understand as patients as well. One is to understand the risk of the patient. As I said, there are things that we can look at, both in your history, your exposure to previous drugs, the way you're, where your disease is, what your disease is behaving like, that can give, you an, uh, it can give you your own risk profile of how you're going to behave with your disease long term. We want to set those treatment goals and make sure that we're aligned in those treatment goals. And sometimes this, again, takes a lot of education because Patients say, well, why would you want to change my medication if I'm feeling well? Is be and I'll show you why that's the case. You want to select the appropriate treatment and you want to make sure that whatever the treatment you're, you've chosen is that it is working, it's controlling the disease, and you're dedicated to changing therapy if it's not. So this is, this is the reason why uh, we don't want to rely just on symptoms. Um, over the last uh, decade or so, we've uh, come to understand that Crohn's disease is a progressive disease. For those of you who've ever had narrowings in your bowel or fistulas, those, uh, that we once thought that those types of diseases were their own separate entity. But our current understanding is that those more complicated, com those more complicated what we call phenotypes or disease cases really arise because of uncontrolled and repeated inflammation. So as you have these bouts of, of disease flares, every time you have one of those flares, it puts you at risk for damaging the intestine or developing complications. And as that happens and you develop complications, it's usually the complications that lead to surgery. So the whole goal is to really to control inflammation. And that's not only in Crohn's disease, but also in ulcerative colitis, where inflammation and ulcerative colitis that's repeated can lead to changes in what people call the leaky gut. It can change the way your colon or your large intestine works. And even if you heal the intestine, it doesn't work properly in the end. So it's all about recognizing and treating inflammation in a timely fashion and to the best, uh, 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 the best possible way. So the, the, the key question here is what are biologic medications? 
So before the biologic era, most medications were chemical structures. That's why they, most of them you know, were pills. They were chemicals that would interrupt uh, with a broad sort of uh, process. Um, Biologics are, are quite different. The biologic era started with really an advance, advancement in science and what we call molecular techniques, where scientists were able to determine specific proteins or molecules that would cause inflammation. And once that happened, you could take different diseases, tonight we're talking about IBD, and say, well, is that molecule or protein very, very important in causing, in this case, inflammation. And once you've done that, you can target, instead of targeting something broadly, you can target that specific molecule. Now to do that, you need to, you need to, to develop what we call an antibody. And an antibody is another protein. So it's not a simple, it, it, and it's a complex structure. It's not a simple chemical where there's a recipe to it. And because of that, biologics are produced in living systems. So um, by definition, it's any virus, therapeutic, toxin, or antitoxin that you can use for the prevention, of treat, uh, prevention treatment, or cure of disease, or injuries of man. So that's a big scientific sort of uh, uh, definition. They can be derived from a variety of living sources. And in the end, what we're developing is these therapeutic uh, proteins. Now, to produce biologics is very, very different than producing, again, a chemical structure like aspirin. Um, so first of all, you need to make sure that you know the protein sequence. I won't go into that in detail. Then you need to have a living system that can reproduce this reliably. Um, so most of these are either viruses and or bacteria that are incubated in and these large tanks. So if you ever go or if or you've ever been into a brewery and you see these large vats that are fermenting or fermenting alcohol or beer um, or wine, this is a similar process, right? In those processes, you use, you use different types of yeast. Here you use different type of bacteria. In those processes, you're producing alcohol as a byproduct. Here you're producing proteins. And so this is a very, very sophisticated um, process and it can be very, very finicky because you need to keep your living system happy and it, within very controlled situations. So the product that you're producing um, is as pure as it, it, as it can be. And by definition, um, that's why we call these biologics because they're produced within living systems. Now, the promise of biologics is the fact that there's a wealth of data after the approval of these drugs that if you introduce these biologic therapies early in the course of disease before there's any complications that you can take those curves that i showed you before of repeated inflammation progressive disease and complications and dampen and flatten that curve and it's that promise of having these highly effective therapies that you can take not only in the short term, but in the long term that have made a vast difference in the outcomes in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. As an overview, you know, one of the key questions is how effective are biological medications for inducing and maintaining disease remissions? Remission. So Paul, Dr. Moyetti will talk more about this. But we know that these drugs can not only get you better, but they can keep you better. Most of them act very, very quickly. And on top of getting your symptoms better, where the transformation has been is they have the ability to control your disease at the disease level or where the inflammation is in your gut. And this is when we talk about this concept of mucosal healing, healing the inner lining of your gut where the, the, that redness or those ulcers were. And by doing that, you can imagine if we, we can do that in a fair proportion of patients that you wouldn't have flares that would lead to hospitalization and you wouldn't have complications that would lead to operations. So 
so to anchor everyone on the on uh, the call tonight or on the WebEx tonight, these are the biologics that are available in Canada for the treatment of Crohn's disease. Um, there's three different classes of drugs, meaning what is their target protein that they're after and, uh, and how do they control it or what do they control? So there's the anti-TNF medications that uh, I would suspect that those who are on a biologic, the majority of you would probably be on one of these because these were the original biologic therapies. They, they, they're antibodies to a specific protein that's not only important in inflammatory bowel disease, but many immune mediated diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, inflammation of the eye, et cetera. There's, uh, the, the, uh, there's what we call originator infliximab, which is, it goes by the brand name Remicade. It's given as an intravenous. And after you get it, you get started on it in the maintenance phase, you take it every four to eight weeks. There's what we call originator adalimumab, which is uh, the brand name is Humira. It's given as an injection that you can self-inject either by a needle or an auto injector. And you usually take this every one to two weeks. There's the anti integrins and this is a little different. This, this, this modulates the way white blood cells traffic to your intestine to cause inflammation. So the, the white blood cells are important for fighting infection. Uh, they're also important to sort of modulate inflammation. And if you can change the way these white blood cells traffic specifically to the gut, you can treat uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Historically, these have been given, this drug has been, is known as Intivio and has been given intravenous, um, but the a subcutaneous or an injectable formulation has just been approved by Health Canada. And so if you're on the intravenous formulation, you would take this uh, typically every eight weeks, some people take it every four weeks. And if you're on the, if you transition or you go on the injection, you could take, you take it every two weeks. And finally, there's another, what we call, call anti-cytokine targeted at a protein, the protein's called IL-1223. It's known as ustekinumab. The brand name is Stolara. It's given initially as one intravenous infusion to get you better. And then you transition into an injection that you can give yourself every, usually every eight weeks, but a proportion of patients may be on it every four weeks. In ulcerative colitis, the shopping list is very similar. Um, you have those originator anti-TNF molecules, uh, Remicade and Humira, and then you have another subcutaneous option called Symphony, but the target is all the same here. And you can also use uh, Intivio and Stellara in ulcerative colitis. Now, one of the common things that patients ask is, well, what biologic is right for me or what biologic should I go on if I need to go on a biologic and how, you know, how do we make those decisions as physician? Um, it's difficult. Um, I always tell my own patients is, you know, the right biologic for you is the one that would work for you. And unfortunately, as Dr. Moyadi will show, is that not all biologics work for all patients. So it's really this a, a holistic approach where we discuss with the patients because there's each of them have their own um, advantages and disadvantages. I sort of highlighted one right, right off the bat of how they're given. Some people who don't wanna go get an intravenous and would prefer a subcutaneous medication and injecting at home, for example. But these are some of the questions we ask. We ask who's the patient, what's your lifestyle, what are your, you know, what are your fears or concerns about medication? Um, what do you want to get out of the medication? How often do you want to take it? You know, um, what is the risk of disease progression? And do you have any complications already of the disease, right? What are we aiming to do with the biologic therapy? We want to discuss the side effects, which we'll discuss a little later, and what your tolerance to those side effects may be. And is your disease just related to your gut or is it associated with other things? Many of you may have joint disease associated with your inflammatory bowel disease, for example, or skin conditions. And we may choose different therapies based on the company that your inflammatory bowel disease keeps and or because we know that there's some shared genetics. If you have another immune mediated diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, 
um, that most of you may be, may recognize by name or something called ankylosing spondylitis, which is back pain, what we would choose in that situation for that particular patient may be different. Overall though, what we wanna do is if you think about your own personal journey, um, you know, before you were diagnosed with your inflammatory bowel disease, you, you know, your quality of life was similar to your age and gender related peers. Um, so that journey in your life does take a, a pretty quick turn when you're diagnosed, when you have the onset of symptoms uh, of inflammatory bowel disease. And there's a lot of confusion before you get diagnosed of what's going on in your life and with your body. And many times, one of the things that happens is there is this delay in diagnosis. And many patients, when they see their, their healthcare providers, don't have a very, very clear sort of idea of what therapies are available and not only what the short-term plan is, but what the long-term plan is. Many of you have been, have been exposed to steroids and they're great, great drugs that we use and, and they can get people better quickly. But the problem is you can't use steroids repeatedly because they have their own side effects. So in 2021, we want to pick those patients who should be on these early biologic therapy and make sure that, again, we control symptoms in their disease and hopefully return them to a normal quality of life. And it's just the beginning. This, I always put this slide up, even when I speak to patients, this is not about sort of anyone memorizing all the, all the drugs that are out there. This is just to say that there is a lot of hope out there for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. As is shown here, this is a selected sort of uh, uh, listing of the drugs that are in development for inflammatory bowel disease. And many of these, at least five of these will be available within the next uh, sort of 18, uh, to 36 months, uh, we believe. So even if you're on a biologic today and you're not where you want to be with uh, your quality of life, there is a very, very bright, bright future. Uh, and there's hope out there because there continues to be these development of, of these therapies. So how about biosimilars? So what is a biosimilar? It, it, a biosimilar is really a copy of a commercially available biopharmaceutical or what we call the reference product. So this, this is again different because you, you have to match this protein or, and um, so as I said, proteins are very, very complex. They have, they have a complex sequence and then that se they have things that allow them to fold in different, different ways. So the key to making a biosimilar medication to originate our product is to get the sequence right and to get the way it folds and the structure as close as possible. Because you know that the biologics worked because those have gone through clinical trials. And so in the biosimilar world, a lot of the development of a biosimilar comes in a very, what we call analytical or the chemistry, how do you make the drug and make sure that that biosimilar does in the lab have all the characteristics of the originator product. It's called a biosimilar because you can't get a bioexact. It's not a generic where there's a chemical structure that you can follow in recipe and you can create that exactly the same. So there are subtle differences and one of the things in the early, you know, in the early understanding of this is whether those subtle differences may impact the way patients uh, react uh, to uh, the biosimilar. And, and Dr. Moyadi will talk about that. As mentioned, they're not the same uh, as uh, as generics. So, uh, because generics are small molecule, small molecule drugs that are easy to uh, replicate, and that's why you have so many generic drugs. The manufacturing process is easy. It's really on an assembly line rather than those big vats of uh, sort of petri dishes that uh, that are producing them. The other thing is just because their newer therapies, meaning that they've come on at a different stage, um, doesn't mean that they're necessarily better. But on the other hand, it, it, it could be that some of the bio, biosimilars may have certain characteristics that are better 
than even the originator uh, than the originator molecule. Now we've not seen that uh, within the evidence, but theoretically, because their difference, just like that subtle difference, may lead to differences in efficacy or safety. Those subtle differences may improve efficacy or decrease safety as well. Right. So uh, another question is, how are biosimilars the same or different from biologic medications? And a lot of it has to do with um, what I've already talked about, but also the way that these drugs are approved. So for a drug to be a biosimilar to be approved, it goes through all of those analytical stages. They submit and they submit that along with at least one study that shows that it works as well or very similar to a reference product. And if that can be demonstrated that the drug looks and feels the same as the originator product and in a disease where the originator product was studied that it led to similar efficacy and safety results, then they can apply for approval. Now, with that comes a whole different uh, conversation. If a biosimilar shows that it works in one of the drugs that the originator uh, product worked on, the regulatory authorities that approve drugs throughout the world will give them all of the indications. So, it, so to give you an example, a biosimilar to Remicade if it works in rheumatoid arthritis and it's been shown to work in a similar fashion, once it's demonstrated that, it will get approved for Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and all of the other diseases that Remicade is approved to uh, with. So that's something that we call extrapolation. You're going to say, well, if it works in this, it's going to work in all of these others. Now, there's a couple of terms that, you, 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 that we just want to go over. So we're going to talk about switching tonight, and that generally refers to a one-time change from your reference biologic, the one that you're on, to a biosimilar. And that's different than interchangeability. Um, interchangeability means that, you, that uh, the pharmacist, for example, has the ability at the pharmacy level to take a prescription and change it to another one. Um, so uh, this is within the intervention of the doctor who wrote the prescription, and that does happen for generic drugs, but it does not happen and should not be happening in Canada for biosimilars. Now, here are the bio, so I, I wanted to, you to get familiar with the names of the originator biologics. Um, these are the biosimilars that are available in Canada with the little asterisks here. So uh, the infliximab biosimilars, these are all on the market. Uh, these are the trade names are Inflectra, Renflexus, and Abzola. There's three of them. Now there's um, originator, uh, there's uh, biosimilars uh, also to Humira. And in the next, uh, and these have now been approved and Humira has, uh, lose, is losing its exclusivity, meaning that if there's switching policies that come into uh, play uh, within uh, throughout the country, that patients on Humira will also be switched to biosimilars or may be switched to biosimilars. And uh, at present, uh, there's uh, five biosimilars, four uh, to Humira that are approved, and four of them are, I, uh, have been named. And there's Jimenez, uh, Amjavita, Emeraldi, and Julio. And again, these are all made by different manufacturers of biosimilar medications. So for those of you who follow me on Twitter, uh, you probably know what my position is on, on what I call non-medical switching. So um, one of the things that I, I don't want anyone to take away from this is biosimilars are not bad therapies. Um, they, they, go th they undergo a, a very thorough regulatory process. And in Alberta, there are patients who need to start a biologic and, uh, for the first time, and we will start the biosimilar medication. And in that patient population, my feeling is that it works as well as the originator. 
Switching is different when you take a person who's on a stable drug for a long period of time and you're making a switch to a biosimilar. And the reason that this switch is often made and policies surround this is because of the cost of the drug. These biosimilars come with at least a 30 to 40% savings in cost to the healthcare system. Now, if the cost was the same, you would not want to switch a patient, right? And Paul will go through it, Dr. Moyetti will go through the, the data. But I think that that decision really needs to be made by the physician and the patient. It, I don't believe that it should be made by a third party who's not, doesn't have for a lack of a better word, skin in the game. I think it needs to be determined in an individual patient basis. We do have patients who have a very broad societal view who said, I'm, I'm happy to switch even without a switch policy. So that's, that's an individual patient decision. It needs to be supported by scientific evidence and Dr. Moyetti will go, aware, uh, go over this. And most importantly, it needs to be performed only with patient awareness. So there needs to be that discussion between the physician and the patient. And the patient needs to be aware when they are going to be getting their first dose of biosimilar, if that indeed is going to happen. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Moyetti to really review the evidence uh, that we know uh, in 2021. So Paul, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Reva. Uh, be a hard act to follow. Um, so I will have to work how to advance the slides. There we are. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest. Um, the position I have at the moment requires that. In the past, my slide would look different. This is how it is over the last three years. <clears throat> and what I want to do is really just, you know, Remo's given a great introduction to the whole of the biologic era in IBD. I'm going to give you the evidence for how they work, how well they work, and I'll only focus on randomized trials uh, for reasons which I will tell you in a minute. I'll also only focus uh, on uh, anti-TNF alpha therapy, the particularly Remicade and the biosimilar uh, Inflectra, because that's where the evidence currently lies. Um, that isn't to say other biologics are, haven't a role or anything, they do, but this is what I'm going to focus on, just because we're going to focus on the evidence and where it is. Uh, and uh, uh, towards the end of the talk, my elements of the talk, I'll obviously give you the data on the biosimilars. We'll start with the originator product and end with the biosimilars. So how effective are biologic medicines for introducing or maintaining disease remission? So I'll give you the evidence for that. But what I would first emphasize is that all of us are not as smart as we uh, uh, think we are, or nearly all of us. And that includes doctors, and it includes researchers, and it includes regulators, and it includes the pharmaceutical industry. And yet, we all sort of know this, but we all forget it. And that's why we're kept honest with randomized controlled trials. If we look at the first biologic in Fliximab or Remicade, you think it was invented in a lab to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, IBD. That is simply not the case. It was actually developed in animal models to uh, help inflammation of the pancreas. And it was trialed in that, in a randomized trial, because it seemed that it was working just great when you just uh, looked and see, see how it worked in a few patients. Uh, but when you did a randomized trial, you actually found that it was killing more people than it was saving, because uh, this disease can kill you, uh, inflammation of the pancreas. And if you take this drug while your pancreas is inflamed, which by the way is very rare, so do not worry, and you'll know about it, you have excruciating pain when this happens, um, you, uh, uh, you actually will die more frequently if you're on uh, Fliximab. So the, the drug company was ready to drop this product until a rheumatologist said, I think it'll work in rheumatoid arthritis and got some of the drug, showed that it did, 
uh, did a randomized trial and showed that it was fantastic in rheumatoid arthritis. By the way, every drug that's fantastic in rheumatoid arthritis up to that point had been fantastic in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So uh, gastroenterologists were straight onto this and tried it in their patients too, and lo and behold, it worked for them as well. But the point for this history lesson is that the way we got here was not linear and we didn't know what we were doing, it was just luck. And that's why you need randomized trials to tell you that something is working and how well something is working. And my job, uh, part of my job is to synthesize the evidence that people like Rebo produce in an unbiased way to give our best guess of how well something works. And in, on the left of the screen, as you look at it, is the Canadian position of statement on this, uh, led by uh, uh, Re uh, Rebo and Hilary Steinhardt. Uh, I was involved in collecting the evidence, but they led the whole uh, group that came with this statement. And basically, these drugs should be used in Crohn's disease as long as it's moderately or, or moderate or severe. Um, and uh, uh, it can induce remission. And all the trials say that. Uh, and there are 500 odd patients in the infliximab trials, 700 odd in Humira trials. That seems like a lot, but actually, and it is, this is why it's high quality evidence, but actually it just reaches that bar. And as an evidence-based medicine guy, I would really like to know more about this uh, as they were being developed, not necessarily now. Um, but I don't blame the drug companies. They will do whatever the regulators will allow them, will tell them to do. I think the regulators, particularly on the Humera and the Symphony drugs, should have asked for more data. They clearly asked for a bit more data, but really not enough in my view. So. We, are, we don't know as much as we think we do even about these drugs, but what we do know is that our best guess is that they do work and one person will go into remission uh, that wouldn't have gone with nature alone out of seven. So basically you've got to treat seven people with these drugs for one to go into remission that wouldn't have gone into remission anyway. That isn't to say it only works in one in seven people, not at all. All, I'm, all that I'm saying is that actually, if you give placebo to people, some will go into remission. And it's just that one in seven extra will go into remission with these drugs. As Remo said, that isn't, that's remission and uh, sort of very high bar for people just improving and uh, um, uh, trying to hone therapy to uh, the best extent, you may get a greater response. But I would also emphasize whatever Remo or whatever I think the response is, we will overestimate it. That's why we do randomized trials. These drugs are, have changed people's lives, but they're not as good as we would like. And this is why there are so many of them. This is why you see that pipeline uh, that uh, Remo showed. It's an excellent slide. Believe me, if these were drugs were uh, miracle workers, there wouldn't be that many drugs following them. So they're good, but they're not absolutely fantastic. They are absolutely fantastic for some people, but not all by any means. Uh, they, in those that respond, they are better at keeping you well. So if you go into remission and you, you should stay on them because uh, the um, uh, chances of you relapsing are a lot higher if you uh, uh, stop taking these drugs than if you carry on taking them. And we've got this from good randomized controlled trials. With ulcerative colitis, we've got one more anti-TNF to think about and basically uh, these drugs work quite well in ulcerative colitis. Um, and given that we have three of these anti-TNF therapies, the evidence base is actually pretty strong here. Uh, 
uh, the number of these digital trees are four is actually pretty good. So I actually don't feel we need more data uh, to know that these drugs get you into remission. Uh, however, to stay there, actually for the first two drugs, we didn't have anything. It's not that we didn't have any studies, but no randomized trial of people in remission randomized to placebo or uh, the anti-TNF. We actually didn't have any way. They got away with it. Again, it isn't the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry that's to blame here. It is the regulator industry just allowing that to happen. But thankfully for sympathy, we do have that evidence. And it, it is pretty good as we might expect. Uh, uh, so that is somewhat reassuring. It is disappointing though, that we don't have more evidence that in, to keep people in remission, uh, these drugs work well. Uh, so and that's only for anti-TNF, I would emphasize. For the other drugs, uh, the situation is different, but I just don't want to focus on that when we're focusing on the evidence here. So are biosimilar medications as safe and effective as biologics? Here, I again want to emphasize we're not as smart as we think we are. What the regulatory authorities really focus on is A, are they as similar as possible to the originator? And B, do they work in one disease? Well, that isn't good enough for, my, for me with an evidence-based hat on. Now, the problem is we know there is plenty of evidence that things can be similar, but not the same and have very different consequences. Hydrogen cyanide will kill you pretty instantly. Change the hydrogen for an iron molecule, and that's what's called food coloring. So and clearly that isn't killing anyone, at least we hope not. Um, but the point is very subtle differences to a molecule can have very different biologic consequences. Now, I don't want to, for any, uh, anyone to think that biosimilars are dangerous. Uh, we know enough to stop that from happening. But to think that they look pretty similar, so they must work the same, is a real problem. Uh, and similarly, if they work in rheumatoid arthritis, they must work in Crohn's disease. Yeah, but they may not work as well. In fact, it is true that biologics are actually more of a miracle for the rheumatoid arthritis patient than they are for the IBD patient, sadly, for us as gastroenterologists. We know they don't work as well in our disease. So the moment you start messing around with it, the danger is uh, you will aggravate this problem. So is there any evidence for this? Well, uh, myself and my colleagues, Dr. Benjamin, you'll hear from in the next uh, talk on this uh, series, but also David Armstrong, Cathy Yuan, Ida Fernandez, and Loris Leontiadis. Uh, we basically um, uh, looked at the evidence uh, for CCC and for uh, CAG. And basically what we find is the attitude moving forward to currently from most organizations is that, uh, yes, they can be switched, but it should be patient doctor choice. Uh, Europe, despite this suggestion, uh, did go for a wholesale switch, and did feel it was safe. But uh, as I will show you, they can't be sure of that. So, if we look at the evidence, uh, and I would emphasize the number of people in randomized trials is larger than this, but those specifically with IBD, we have one randomized trial in 220 Crohn's patients. And as far as we can tell, uh, they work uh, similarly. Now, because the numbers are small, we, there's a lot of uncertainty, but the bottom line is, our best guess is Remicade is 5% better. It sounds like a lot, but in medical terms, given that these drugs are not miracle workers, it isn't that impressive. And it is probably uh, safe to switch as Remo, not switch, to start someone on the biosimilar. 
because the people who are naive to this agent, they seem to work roughly as well. And what really convinced us was actually another study, which isn't as good a design, but was in 5,000 French patients with Crohn's disease, where half were switched uh, at the patient's dis uh, clinician discretion to uh, Inflectra. Sorry, half started on Inflectra, half started on Remicade, both all being naive. And basically, they were very similar. The, now with these big numbers, it's actually flavored in Flectra, but when it's not randomized, you can't be sure. With these small differences, the bottom line is there's no signal for excess harm or any difference in efficacy with these uh, drugs in Crohn's disease uh, in people who are naive to this agent, haven't had it before, do we start it? So the bottom line is our feeling is it's fine to do this in people who haven't actually had the drug yet. When we look at switching, so people now have been well on this drug for at least three to six months, often a lot longer. Um, and you switch them from uh, Remicade to Inflectra, that it was that for both of these trials. Is there any signal for worry? And the answer is yes and a qualified yes. So the number needed to harm is 11. So you have to switch 11 people for one to lose response uh, compared to just staying on the original. So most people do fine. That's the first thing to emphasize. So if you just do a wholesale switch in one country from one drug to another, you won't see any difference. This is too small a signal for this to be apparent. Uh, this is why you have to have randomized trials. But for the individual patient where this happens, you really, you know, that's not a, a, um, a, a, an insignificant thing. Often people have, you know, got their intermission uh, with a lot of struggling. So that one in 11 patient is an issue. Although I have to emphasize, we're not certain of that figure. And we never will be because there's going to be no more randomized trials. And unfortunately, unlike that French large study where there was that allowance of uh, doctor patient decision, that seems to not be happening in most of Canada. And uh, as I say, has not happened in Europe. So we won't have uh, that, um, that level of evidence that we would like. But this is our best guess. Now, is this bad? Is this good? Cost is an issue here as well. Uh, these drugs are, are less expensive, these biosimilars. So, uh, and uh, the, the government who, you know, has to use taxpayers' dollars wisely uh, may feel this is sensible, but uh, I do feel there needs to be a more transparent discussion uh, with patients uh, so that we can decide what is the right way forward. Uh, so for uh, a non-medical switching from the originator to a biosimilar, at least as far as Remicade is concerned, we recommended against it, although again, the evidence is very low quality. So hopefully I've showed you that these drugs are effective and need to be taken long term. Uh, they're not miracle drugs for everyone by any means. And for, for as far as biosimilars go, if you're starting it, it probably works as well. But if you're switching, because that, there's that slight dissimilarity and you've already declared yourself as working with this drug, the odd person will not do as well on the biosimilar because it is slightly different. And with that, I think we're open to questions. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you to both Dr. Panaccioni and Moyetti. Um, really good primer. Um, just wanted to let the audience know this webinar is till 8.30. Um, and we are receiving a lot of questions. We're going to do our best to cover them. Please know that uh, our initial questions are based on the questions that were submitted during the registration part of the webinar. 
And if we don't cover your uh, questions, what we will do is we will take them back and um, try to update our website, either under the frequently asked question, we do have a biologic and biosimilar section, and we will be updating the contents to ensure that we can um, uh, have some form, form of answer for you. So with that, um, Sarah, could you advance to the next slide, please? Okay, so the first question is for Dr. Panaccioni, if you don't mind. What are some of the short and long-term risks or side effects of using biologic and biosimilar medications? And are, are there any specific to biologic use in children? Yeah, and it's a great question. And I think it's one of the things that we need to discuss with patients when they decide uh, what drugs to go on. Um, we talked a lot about anti-TNF uh, tonight. And so anti-TNFs themselves um, are associated with a uh, an increased risk of uh, infection. So that increased risk of infection over a year is about to one in 10, where somebody may have like a bronchitis or an uh, upper respiratory tract infection or a urinary tract infection. Um, and then uh, out of those, about one in 100 will require a biologic, I mean, a antibiotic over a year. The ones that, the, the long-term side effects that uh, individuals on say an anti-TNF worry about or um, this originally there was thought to be an increased risk in what we call the lymphoma risk which is a blood cancer um, and some serious side and some serious more serious infections that risk now if you look at all the literature and systematic reviews that Paul does um, is very very low it's thought to be less than 0.1 per 100 patient years, meaning that as a patient, you'd need to be on the drug for a thousand years before you would be have one of those lymphomas arise. Or in, in, a, in my practice, I need like a thousand patients on it for a year. So infections, lymphoma, and then injection site reactions or in, or in what we call infusion reactions can happen in about two to 5% of uh, individuals. Some of the newer um, you know, biologics like um, Stellara, and I'll call them by their trade name because that's how most patients know them, Stellara and Intivio, the risks of sort of uh, lymphoma and serious infections don't seem to be the same. Um, they are described in the clinical trials at similar rates, but not at different rates than placebo. And then in kids, there, there is a very rare uh, lymphoma that was is described um, called a, a uh, it's related to lymphoma that, that's in the spleen, um, but that risk is now thought to be about one in twelve thousand, um, and it's usually related to children who are on combinations of therapy. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just. There was a question that was posed by a few audience members, and I thought it's a good segue based on this question. In it's the question around long versus short term. Um, it's around the idea as to how do you define long term? Um, are there situations where patients respond to a biologic or biosimilar for 10, 20 years, or is there like a time limit more or less? Yeah, I mean, there's there. This is another common question, and, and it's very variable because these are proteins. Every time you, the way I explain it to patients is, every time that you get, uh, you get an infusion or an injection, it's like getting vaccinated. You're the, the proteins are foreign; they're not your protein, and so there is a risk that your immune system will not like it from the perspective of it wants to destroy the medication, something we call immunogenicity. And that can leave the drug not to work over time. Um, and that can be as high as 20 to 30% in the first year of, that you can develop it and lose response. And then about 10% per year uh, after that. And there's things you can do to reduce those, those chances. But, you know, I have patients who have been on you know, Remicade was released in Canada in 2001. And so I have patients who've been on Remicade for 19 straight years, right? Um, so that's long-term. And most of the studies now for biologics, as far as open label safety, they go out about five to seven years now. Uh, could I 
Uh, Absolutely, please. Uh, drop in here. I, I, this is one area where Remo and our, if, our practice, if you look at it, will be broadly similar. Uh, and actually, even the long term will be somewhat similar, but I have a slightly different attitude to this. Uh, one thing I'd say is for the kids, the hepatos, uh, you know, T cell lymphoma, um, it's very, very rare, but it kills you. There is no cure, there is no treatment, you will die. So you've really got to be careful of that in kids, but it's usually just people who are on another immunosuppressant as well, not uh, just the biologic. So the risks are very low, but don't be taking um, Imuran or something like that as well. That, that's a really bad news as a kid. Um, as far as the uh, short and long-term risks or side effects um, of using biologics and biosimilars, my view is we just don't have the, the data there. Um, what uh, Remo is saying is correct. You will, you may mount an immune response and that may make you lose the effectively of the drug. The question is, does stopping the drug mean that it will never work again? And the answer to that is simply, that's, we know that's not true. It may, it may work just as well the next time round. There is some evidence that your immune system may well kick in if you do not get the drug, but actually our knowledge of the immune system is such that's not usually the way it works. And in the UK, where I started giving the drug in about 2000, really showing my age, uh, the way it was given was exactly that. It was used a bit like steroids. Is you, were, you got it for a couple of months, you then had stopped, see what happened, got it again, and that actually worked fine. Um, it's not a randomized trial, so I don't know that for sure. What I do know is we don't know what the effects of stopping the medication are. It may be fine, it may not, but we really need to study it. Unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry isn't going to be invested in you stopping their drug. So my practice is always to give the patient the choice after about five years. So they always have a choice anyway, but I actually have the conversation with them five years out. Do you want to continue on this um, or do you not in this evidence-free zone? The only evidence we do have is with the older immunosuppressants like Imuran, which are, by the way, fine in adults, uh, although they carry similar or greater risks of infection and lymphoma, as well as other things. Um, they, uh, the evidence from them is you are probably twice as likely to relapse if you stop these drugs and if you carry on. And maybe biologics are similar, uh, maybe not. Some people, choose to stop them in my practice, some people carry on. I guess this really stresses the importance of the patients being informed and um, uh, having that thoughtful discussion with their um, care provider to really weigh out the, cons uh, the pros and cons, I suppose. So thank you both uh, for uh, weighing in on this question. So Sarah, can we move on to the next question? How long do you typically wait for a biologic to induce remission before trying another biologic medication? And a follow-up question to that is, how many biologics can, you, can someone try before needing a surgery? So um, Dr. Panaccioni, I know I've asked you to answer the first two questions, so I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Moyetti to start uh, answering this question. And Pan Dr. Panaccioni, if you have any additional comments, please feel free to add. Yeah, so if you look at the trials, uh, um, most, well, all of them look at it at least eight weeks out, and actually it's more like three a month, three to four months, which is what I would typically leave one biologic before trying another. We, uh, despite the advantages they're having, at the moment we have a fairly limited armamentarium, so you don't want to you don't want to just give up on one before you're really sure that it doesn't work. So as long as you're not, I mean, the thing is very different if you're in hospital and fulminantly sick. But if you're managing to cope okay, I would normally give it at least three to four months uh, before trying another biologic, uh, and. Um, uh, sometimes longer if there's some improvement, but you're not sure how much. Uh, but it's rare that I switch someone before three months. And then how, how many can you try? 
before needing surgery. It depends on the severity of your disease and how much of a response you've had to any biologics and patient choice. Um, you could try them all, or if you're, if you're getting pretty sick and getting out there, you, you may, after trying one or two, really need to go to surgery. Uh, there are so many factors there. I don't think anyone could give you an answer on how many biologics. It's more how you are as a person and what your choice, you feel your choice should be. Dr. Panaccioni, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that it's individualized by the patient and it's, it's a continuum. There's patients who get better very, very quickly within weeks with a biologic and there's some that take several months and there's some that need adjustment in the dose. But usually by four to six months, you would know if that's the case. The difference in the clinical trials is those are arbitrary um, cutoffs that are picked out of a hat of, and that's what we base our data on, as opposed to what we do in clinical practice. And uh, knowing that, again, there's uh, individual patients, it, it's a continuum. So I think usually if you're a patient and you're being treated by your gastroenterologist, they'll want to see over at least a period of four months and make some dose adjustments possibly. The second one is really a question of, um, whether or not your disease would do better than sur with surgery than another biologic. And so you can imagine that if, you're if your intestine's already damaged um, because of the inflammation that's there and there's scar tissue there, uh, which is the typical example, these biologics don't treat scar tissue, they treat inflammation. And so sometimes, you know, your individual gastroenterologist or healthcare provider may say, okay, let me try one biologic to see if there's some inflammation there that I can open up the intestine and avoid surgery. That patient, I would say, you know, they should get maybe one, um, you know, one bio chance at a biologic. If you're on your second biologic, uh, in general, you should be seen, uh, you should be uh, sort of seeing a surgeon to discuss the options. Um, if it's always inflammation, it's just about, you know, as, as Dr. Moyeti suggested, is um, there is a little bit of trial and error. Um, not everyone re responds to the same biologic. Um, and so uh, it could be that you need to try a second biologic. And that's one of the most disappointing things when you have four, for example, you try A first and B second and C and none of them work. And then D does work. And you're saying, oh, why didn't I try D first, right? I wish we had the, the knowledge to be able to do that, but we don't. So as long as your disease is not progressing, I don't think you need to go to early surgery. Thank yeah. you. So Rebo put it a lot better than I. What I would say is there are people with relative not mild, mild disease, but relatively mild disease where you may not involve your surgeon so early. So certainly my practice, not everyone that's switching to the second one will see a surgeon. Uh, you know, if I feel that even if this doesn't work, they're not imminently going to need surgery uh, or even in the relatively near future. But certainly if there are high risk signs, I would agree with Remo. You, you, you should be seeing a surgeon on your second biologic if, uh, if things are not progressing as well as we hoped. Yeah, and, and that doesn't, and just to clarify for the audience, that doesn't mean that you need surgery, is that it's more, I mean, in our practice, it's more about education so that you know what the surgery may be for you rather than saying, and I always have to tell my patients that, well, I think we, you should speak to a surgeon so that you have the information. Doesn't mean you need surgery tomorrow, but as we start to get into the decision of biologic three or four, right, you may want to make a different decision for yourself. So it, it, I, I think it's, we always need to think that surgery is an option and shouldn't be a last resort when people are, are very, very sick. So mm. just to clarify that for the audience. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah, next question was, I believe this is something that I, I think we've, um, I myself uh, in my role have heard a lot about, um, uh, should biologics and biosimilar medications, and I know Dr. Panaccioni, mm. you kind of touched upon that, um, but if you could, um, reiterate medications only be used as a last resort if other medications with fewer risks do not work. 
Yeah, and and I have a very strong feeling of, about this. And so, if my my if any of my patients are on the on this, they know my opinion. I think that for the individual patient, you need to use the best therapy that you have. So, highly effective medications should be used. And as opposed to what Dr. Moyetti said. There is, there is indirect evidence and a lot of indirect evidence that suggests that if we use these drugs earlier in the disease and even subgroup analysis from the trials, that the effectiveness is better, right? As we set this up and, and we need to study that better. Um, and I think that this is probably one of the biggest pitfalls in clinical practice, either from the medical side and or the patient side is that you want to use these as last resort drugs. Um, it, you know, I think that you want to use these appropriately at the right time. Um, and if I were to reflect back, and we have data here from the University of Calgary, the biggest thing was isn't that the biologics are available, it's how you use them and when you use them that probably makes the biggest difference. Yeah, and actually, although we may argue about the the quality of the evidence, although even there, I don't think there's a lot between Remo and I. Uh, I our well, practice is fairly similar, other than um, I will tend to give patients uh, a course of steroids, as most of us do, to quickly get people well. Uh, off, I'll then ask the patient about biologics. I won't make them or you know, push them hard to go on biologics for the first course of steroids, but if they're needing another one, uh, certainly if they're having uh, another course of steroids within the next couple of years, uh, I will push pretty hard that they go on biologics. But I will also, uh, they should not be used as a last resort medication. I completely agree with Reba. However, what I will say is patient choice is preeminent. And even given all the evidence, uh, some patients do not want to take biologics, and I'm fully supportive of that. And indeed, my practice is skewed towards that because I also uh, study fecal transplants, and so some of my patients are, you know, that's what they want to try first. Um, and uh, I, I certainly believe that our job is to give the patient the best evidence that we, can think we know, and then they make the choice. Thank you, Dr. Moyedi. Um, just to, I, maybe you could just clarify, since you talked about fecal transplants, is that good for both Crohn's disease and UC, or, or is this uh, more specific to UC patients that you're referring to? So the trials we've mainly done of UC, although we started a trial that's led out of Edmonton, but and also is done in Calgary in Crohn's disease. Uh, so the, these treatments are available in, in uh, uh, Alberta as well. Uh, and indeed, the Crohn's disease one is led out of Alberta. Uh, but um, uh, with COVID, none of this can happen because COVID mm -hmm. is excreted in the stool. So we, uh, we've recruited all our ulcerative colitis patients um, in our latest trial. We will start another one when COVID ends. Uh, uh, we're applying to Health Canada to do this during COVID. Uh, but obviously it's going to be for a very select group of people. Um, but yes, uh, it is available to as an option uh, for you if you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Uh, but unfortunately at the moment, only if you are in Alberta or you know in the uh, greater Toronto area. Uh, but it um, is a clinical trial as you, sorry, I was just going to say, it is a clinical trial as you indicated. So it is, um, it is not something you should, anyone should be giving to, any, to you just because it might work. But Perfect. in the context of a, a, a proper clinical trial, uh, it, it's another option that you can have in that context. Uh, as I happen to do those trials, I get a skewed practice. So, um, uh, I have more people who tend to use uh, biologics as a last resort, uh, but fecal transplants don't work in everyone either. So uh, often once that hasn't worked, they are more willing to go on to biologics and some are doing very well on them. Great, thank you. Next question, Sarah, please. So 
So are biologics effective, effective in treating fistulas? Are there specific biologics that are optimal for treating fistulas? Uh, Dr. Panaccioni? Yeah, so, so um, there is what we call level one evidence for Remicade to treat um, fistulas. There's a dedicated trial looking at that and it, it's found our way into the guidelines. Um, if you look at the other anti-TNFs, um, if you look at patients within trials, um, within those trials, they're not specific trials designed to look at fistulas, but the rates are, are comparable to what was seen with Remicade. And similarly with uh, some of the newer biologics like Stellara and, and Vitalizumab. So we tend to use anti-TNFs for fistulizing disease and reserve the other drugs um, for those that don't respond. And we wrote a long, an, an article sort of a couple of years ago, just going over all the evidence for it. So again, it, it's, it, 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 fistulas are a big problem in patients with Crohn's disease and they significantly alter quality of life. So when anti-TNFs don't work, um, you, we do have that discussion of other biologics, but usually it's, it is the anti-TNFs that we start with first. Great, thank you. Next question, Sarah, please. Could changing my medication from a biologic to a biosimilar trigger a flare? Dr. Moyeti. Uh, yes, so it's a biologic, so biosimilars are biologics, but uh, if you talk about it from the original drug to the biosimilar, as I said, there is a small uh, risk that you're, you would get a flare, which you wouldn't have done had you stayed on the original drug. Of course, the risk of having a flare is overall is bigger, but uh, for that group, they'd have had it anyway. Most of them would have had it anyway, uh, but maybe one in 11 would not have uh, if you had the, uh, if you had stayed on the originate. Thank you. Uh, next question, Sarah. Are there any benefits to switching to a biosimilar medication? And I assume it's switching. So I assume this question is premised around that uh, the patient is on a biologic. Yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, there's not, there's no data that suggests that there's benefits switching to it. Um, regardless of what I said, there could be a potential benefit just because of, again, the structure of the molecule. Um, so most of these switching policies are being done for cost purposes and to save money. Um, and, and that's, I think, the arguments that a lot of make is that if the costs were the same, you would, you would continue to be on the drug that has worked for you and, and has continued to work for you. Um, so aside from the benefit potentially to society and healthcare systems, to the individual patient, I can't see that there's a tangible benefit. Yeah, I, I agree. Although what I'd emphasize is that, you know, the difference in cost, at least from, uh, from uh, the original price of the product to the biosimilar isn't minor. And uh, it astonishes me how people are very angry that um, they're being switched, but they don't want to pay more taxes and want in fact taxes to be reduced. You can't have it always. And uh, this is where the societal thing that Remo is going about comes in, is that as a society, we cannot afford to give all the healthcare that we could that would maximally benefit the whole of the population. It's just not possible. There are tough choices that have to be made. And we may, not, we may or may not agree with this one, but politicians actually do have a tough job here. Uh, but I, I just feel that they need to be transparent about what's happening. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to end with one more question. Unfortunately, um, I see we have a lot more questions coming in and I, I'm going to reiterate that uh, if we haven't answered your questions, we do take all your questions back with us and we'll update our website accordingly to ensure that um, our website does have the answers that you're looking for. So the last question is, if I change my medication to a biosimilar, what happens to my treatment if I do not respond well to a biosimilar? Am I able to switch back to the originator biologic? So um, I don't, Dr. Panaccioni. Yeah, so 
I'm gonna I'm gonna use this opportunity to send a couple messages. I think is number one. I think that in the ideal situation, um, none of you who are on this call who may be in this situation would need would need to make that decision. Um, if you are faced with this and um, you have to switch, you're forced to switch, then um, I think the majority of patients are going to do well. And it's our job with you to keep you in an environment that we can respond if you don't do well. And so we've gone through this in Alberta and uh, our patients know this, we're monitoring them very closely to, because we know that some patients, as Dr. Moyetti suggested, even if you stayed on your biologic, you would, you would be able, you may lose response to that. So to tease that out in the individual patient is very, very difficult. So you want to know why, and there's reasons that people lose response, and you want to make sure that it's not because of this, it's not due to the switch, and rather something that would happen anyway. So there's some things you need to do. If what we've seen so far is that there are patients who um, have lost when they've sort of not done well with the switch, it's because of a biologic issue, meaning that they've developed antibodies to the drug or they've developed a new intolerance to the switch. So, and they're very nonspecific. And so the intolerances we've switched back to the originator with success. The ones that have what we call a pharmacological reason to have lost the response, going back to the originator is not gonna work. So it's, it's a bit of a complex, uh, complex uh, um, question to answer. Um, so the answer is some for intolerance probably can go back go back to the originator. Um, if you if you it's not due to intolerance, it's usually due to either a slight switch in the mechanism um, or a pharmacological effect, and then switching back probably will, won't help you. Dr. Moyetti, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, no, that's perfect. Uh, what are, I've just been looking at the questions that are coming, and there's a lot around, well, BC and Alberta mandate a switch. Uh, and uh, Ontario probably will do the same thing. Um, that's true. Uh, and actually, part, who knows with Quebec. But um, uh, what we're talking about is the evidence and our view of... Uh, what we feel would be ideal for the patient. And our feeling is it should be a uh, discussion with the patient and have a choice. I would emphasize that the evidence is the harm that would be done from what is happening in BC and Alberta is relatively modest, but there is a possibility for some harm uh, to individual patients. I'm not sure that means it's a bad thing but the, the gov I think the provincial government should be more honest about what they're doing and rather than just saying, oh, it's perfectly safe. We know. I'm not sure we do. And uh, the, there may be the odd patient that runs into this problem that Remo has talked about. And actually the money they save would be better being invested in the, uh, in the disease area so that we can completely mitigate uh, at least in the society of IBD patients, any harm that might be done. But of course, that isn't happening either. Um, so it's not, we realize that what we're saying can't happen necessarily in Alberta or British Columbia, and indeed probably in other jurisdictions in Canada soon. But we're just telling you our perspective. Is that fair, Remo, or have I misrepresented? No, I, I, I think that there are, we know that there's reasons that various stakeholders uh, wanted want to make these switches. I think that, um, you know, my view as a healthcare provider and, um, and I think the view of CCC is that we're advocates for the patient. And so regardless of what decisions are made by other stakeholders, um, we, we want our view to be known. And, and if, you know, we need to work in an environment where this switching happens. Once again, we just want to be in a position to best support you as an individual patient, not only sort of psychologically. So some patients have a lot of anxiety over this. And um, I think that it's our responsibility to support you through that anxiety. I think that that's natural to have. 
Um, and again, be in a position that if you were one of the unlucky individuals, and I will use the word unlucky, um, that we have a plan for you that we can still sort of, uh, again, maintain your health and wellness and your quality of life and be able to respond in a, in a quick fashion to get you back to where you were before the switch. And that's the message that we send to the patients now. That's great. Thank you so much to both. Uh, I'm, we're already getting um, comments back in the chat box of how fantastic a talk this was. So I think I already know this answer, but we are going to launch a poll uh, just to see whether we met some of our objectives of educating. So if those of the um, audience member who are here, if you could fill out this poll, just to let us know whether you um, learned something from this session. So the first question is, how would you rate your current understanding of biologic medications? And the second question is, how would you rate your current understanding of biosimilar medications? Okay, uh, for the biologics, I believe we've moved over. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were a lot more somewhats uh, at the beginning of this talk. This is great. Uh, happy to hear that you've learned something from this session. And number two, um, I guess I need to scroll down to see what the result is. Same thing. Uh, same thing, fantastic. So we've achieved our goal of um, educating you and that goes full credit to Drs. Panaccioni and Moyeri for uh, teaching the audience on what are the differences be between biologics and biosimilars and also educating about the interchangeability of the two, um, two therapeutics. So thank you very much again, Dr. Moyeri and Panaccioni. Um, this was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we all learned a lot. Thank you to the audience. Um, please know uh, that there will be a survey and we do rely on the survey um, to, get, uh, to get a sense of how well we did, what, what could be our future topics and so forth. So I hope you'll take the survey. And um, as well, um, if you enjoy these type of presentation, we ask you to um, uh, consider donating to CCC. Uh, if you, through your smartphones, you could donate $25 by texting to uh, CURE to 20222. So thank you so much and hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening, everyone. And for the patients, uh, stay safe, stay well. Okay. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.